5.50 p.m. The House will now proceed to the consideration of private members' business according to the order paper. Business motion M380 in the name of Mrs. Delphine Giral, Genocide Armenien. Armenian Genocide debate. Order, please. Madame Dalfon. Ms. Dalfon Giral, seconded by Mr. Asturian, moved, uh, moves that this House acknowledge the Armenian Genocide of 1915 and condemn this act as a crime against humanity. Debate. The Honorable Member for Laval Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Before beginning my speech, I would like to ask for unanimous consent of the House for two other seconders to the motion, one from the Conservative Party and one from the NDP. Does the Honorable Member have the names of these new seconders? Yes, Mr. Speaker. The Member for Calgary South East and the Member for Halifax. Is there unanimous consent? to allow Mr. Kenny and Ms. McDonough to be added as additional seconders for the main motion. Agreed? Agreed and so ordered. The Honourable Member for Laval Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today we are debating a subject that which, uh, with time, has become recurring here in the House of Commons. We are debating the recognition of the Armenian genocide of 1915, and this has a special connotation today because there will be a vote unless there are elections which would prematurely put an end to the work of the House. Those who know me know full well that I've been interested in this matter for some days, for some time now, and they know that recognition of history is important in order to avoid the mistakes of the past. Such a recognition would also offer us a privileged opportunity to examine present and future socio-political situations that could cause another genocide. We will review the history of the recognition of the Armenian genocide here in the House of Commons, the uh, lobby, the uh, international scene, and in closing, the facts and the importance of voting in favor of this uh, motion, M380. The text of the motion reads as follows, that this House acknowledge the Armenian genocide of 1915 and condemn this act as a crime against humanity. Since the beginning of the 37th Parliament, that is, since the last federal elections in 2000, this is the fourth time that we debate a motion relating to recognizing the Armenian genocide. The three motions debated previously, of which I was initiator in two cases, and the member for Brampton Center introduced another, and most interventions were in favor of recognizing the genocide, but we didn't have an opportunity to vote because of the previous rules of procedure for private members' business. So this will be the first time in some time that we will have an opportunity to truly take a stand in this debate. We can go back to 96 when the last vote on this subject took place in the House of Commons. At that time, parliamentarians unanimously supported the following motion that the House recognize on the 81st anniversary of the Armenian tragedy that caused the loss of 1,005,000 human lives on April 24, 1915, and with respect to other crimes against humanity, that the week from the 20th to 27th of April every year will be a week devoted to recognizing the inhumanity of man against his neighbor, and this is a step in the right direction. However, it didn't mention a genocide, but rather a tragedy. This wording was not the initial one, because at the time we were talking about genocide, but it was difficult for some parliamentarians to use that term, which led to the amendment that I just read. However, many things have happened since then. And that is why it is even more relevant to bring this debate up to date. It might seem strange in Canada's parliament to say that the Senate was a 
a leader in this area. In uh, June of 2002, the Canadian Senate adopted a motion with three objectives. First, to recognize the events of 1915 as being a genocide, and then to condemn any attempt to deny this historical fact or to depict it in terms other than a genocide. And finally, April 24th of each year would be designated as the year to commemorate the Armenian genocide. The Senate adopted this motion. And uh, the world did not stop turning, nor did it cause any acts of violence or terrorist attempts, as some opponents, unfortunately, would like us to believe. We would like to set certain facts straight with respect to the those who uh, don't agree with this theory. I can agree that some people don't agree with what I'm doing, but... Uh, and no one will be surprised to see that not everyone sees history in the same way because history has to be read carefully because it has been written by the victors. However, I deplore that we would use the fear of terrorism to discredit the recognition of the Armenian genocide, and I refuse to subscribe to the statement by which M380 would be full of racism. Demagoguery is not the best way to put forward one's arguments, and the various threats as to peace and deterioration of relations between Canada and Turkey do not take into account the precedence in recognizing the Armenian genocide. We must realize that the House of Commons will not be creating any precedent in voting in favor of this motion. Just across the Ottawa River, as was the case in Ontario, the National Assembly of Quebec officially recognized the genocide in 19. And more recently, on September 10, 2003, Quebec adopted an act proclaiming April 24th as a day to commemorate the Armenian genocide. On the international scene, a number of states and parliaments have recognized this genocide. And I will name a few, Argentina, Belgium, France, Russia, the European Parliament, the European Council and more recently Switzerland, a number of American states, some 30 in fact have recognized this genocide. The case of European states and uh, countries is quite interesting, even though there were threats of diplomatic reprisals, there was support for these countries to enter the European Union, the threats did not materialize and the Turkish ambassador in Paris after having been repatriated for a short time after the French National Assembly recognized the genocide is back in his position and this did not cause any particular tension in the French-Turkish relations nor did it cause acts of violence or terrorism between uh, French uh, citizens of uh, Turkish origin or Armenian origin. History is the responsibility of historians, and it isn't up to politicians to challenge the veracity of certain facts. Many professors, historians, and researchers have recognized these facts and have stated that this was indeed a genocide. Among them, Professor William Shabas, an expert in international law, Leo Kipper, expert in matters of genocide, Raphael Limkin, who was involved in the United Nations Convention Against Genocide. They've all recognized that the genocide did take place in 1915. Amongst politicians recognizing the genocide, there was William Winston Churchill and David Lloyd George, former uh, prime ministers of Great Britain, as well as uh, of the annihilation of the Armenians. For those who are wondering whether or not it is up to us to remember history, the answer has just been provided. 1.5 million Armenians were killed at the beginning of the 20th century, and this wasn't during the First World War, but rather in the context of this war, which is very different. In the same order, we might say today that the 6 million Jews killed in the Second World War died in combat. No, that was not the case. They died within the context of the Second World War, but not in combat, and I'm pleased today to salute a very humane gesture that uh, 
took place in the Second World War by the ambassador of Turkey to France, who was saved from concentration camps and from a certain or probable death. A large number of Jews uh, from the community in Lyon before the First World War, 20% of the population within Turkey were not Muslim. And after the war, this percentage was about 2.5%. These are facts that have been recognized by a number of historians and experts. Now, why should my colleagues support this motion? I'll give you an example. If a person commits a deliberate murder before your very eyes, if everyone knows it, if the lawyers, the judges, the police know it, but if no one recognizes that this is a murder, then what criteria will they use in the future to determine what what is a murder from what is not a murder. The fact that one closes one's eyes on a historical reality might make this non-recognition a type of uh, case law for events that are happening now and could happen in the future. Planning a genocide requires strategy and a definite uh, dynamic, and we have to recognize these to understand what elements will cause these uh, crimes against humanity and recognizing that the events that happened in 1915 represent a genocide, we are allowing researchers, historians, and professors to understand and study what happened, keeping in mind that this was indeed a genocide. And in this way, we, they will be able to establish links between various genocides so as to determine similarities and circumstances that um, might cause these to happen again. And once we have the necessary tools to allow us to better understand how a genocide is planned, then perhaps the international community will be able to identify them in time to react quickly and avoid being too late, as was the case for the Rwandan genocide that has only just been recognized in the House. This recognition isn't meant to condemn the present Turkish government, and Motion M380 doesn't ask for that, doesn't ask for any kind of monetary or territorial compensation for Armenians. By recognizing the Armenian genocide, Canada is not accusing Turkey of anything. They're just recognizing what happened historically, that's all. In conclusion, I'd like to reassure the people, the Turkish community, this motion is not trying or looking to try to hold them responsible for ha what happened in 1915. It happened in the past. It should be recognized as we are against any and all forms of violence and the misfortune they, that violence carries with it. We will at least be recognizing history, and we will perhaps have the tools necessary to build a better world. People, peoples, and ordinary people are often wounded during their lives, and this is what happened here. By recognizing the genocide against the Armenians, we will help to solve the wounds a little and give the international community the will to look ahead while respecting differences. Thank you. Five minutes questions or comments. Cinq minutes de questions et commentaires. Sinon, oh, excuse. Uh, L'honorable député de... Honorable member for Hunsik. Five minutes questions or comments. Five minutes de questions et commentaires. Sinon, oh, excuse. Uh, L'honorable député de. Honorable member for Hunsik. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'd like to congratulate my colleague. I know that she's very passionate on this subject. We've had many opportunities to work together on this matter. I congratulate her once again for being so tenacious and once again bringing forth her point of view on this matter, which is very important for the Armenian-Canadian community. I also want to congratulate her for having summarized all the very important facts, the most important facts, I'm awfully sorry, on this side of the House. There is a lot of support. There is a lot of support, that's true. And we will show our support to the member 
when we have our own turn. Now, I'd like to ask her as a question and give her an opportunity to, to elaborate on this. If for this motion was passed already, if there were consequences, negative consequences to passing this kind of motion, because we hear that there are negative uh, consequences to all this in other countries. Honorable member for Laval Centre. If my colleague, with her comment, I thank my colleague for her comment, and I appreciate it. Look, um, it's clear that economic threats sometimes do have an impact. They're used because people think they give power. But what we know, particularly for France, is that there was no... Turkey did not draw out of its commitments it had and contracts it had with France. And I'm sure this would be the same thing here. You know, we often say that money doesn't smell. And basically you do business with a country when you figure it's in your economic interest to do so. And Canada, of course, will continue negotiating with Quebec because Quebec and Canada do business together. I think that in this whole matter of the Armenian genocide and the possibility that maybe the Turkish government might uh, change its investments in Quebec or the rest of Canada, I think basically it's one way of putting pressure on, but I know that as parliamentarians and a population, that's the kind of thing that won't actually uh, influence our collective decision. Thanks, uh, the Honourable Member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much. Uh Mr. Speaker, I'd like to congratulate the Honourable Member from Black Quebecois for presenting this motion. I'd like to ask her a question. Uh, if it's possible she could comment, recently after French government passed a motion for a genocide, Swiss government done a similar thing. I wonder if she could react any reaction from the side of the Turkish government to, to protest this action of the Swiss government. That's my first question. If I'm allowed to ask a second question very quickly, Mr. Speaker, Mother, Mr. Speaker the fact is that we received many letters of complaint from Turkish point of view from states. Basically, Americans telling us what to do. I wonder if you should comment on those two points. Thank you. Honorable, Deputy de la... Honorable Member for Laval Center, thank you, dear colleague, for this. It's clear that this matter is extremely sensitive, both for the Armenians as well as for the Turks. I have no problem in believing that or understanding it. It's just that they look at this as a reproach to the Turkish community. And they have a very powerful lobby to try to influence the parliamentarians sitting in this house. I can understand it also. But, you know, we weren't always necessarily impressed by comments that come from our friends, the Americans. The recent uh, conflict in Iraq is proof of the pudding. So, I mean, all this these pressure tactics are things that can be done, it's no problem, but I hope that they won't influence us. Still have time. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon, when you're uh, briefly though. I'd like to ask the, uh, the member, I know in correspondence to different members here, she has indicated that this has no implications in terms of uh, land or reparations or that. I, I know when the NDP party has brought this up, although that's not always part of their motion in this House, uh, in their NDP stated policy, in fact, that is, that there should be reparations of land and so on uh, that would go back uh, to, to the Armenian people. I have a uh, great sadness in terms of my own heart on those matters that happened in those days, uh, awful days, uh, in uh, that period of time. But I do have the question, and I am concerned, that when one country, uh, be it any country in the world, passes that, it is then used by uh, the various... Uh Excuse, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, there is no time left in questions or comments. May I recognize But with the indulgence of the Speaker, I'll allow the member for Laval Centre to briefly answer. Thank you. You're so kind to me, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think that in this whole matter, it's not reparation that are important. What's important, I think, is that the Armenian people know that its historical facts, the wounds inflicted upon it, are recognized by the international community. And from my perspective, it's way more than reparations. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's very easy to give money or to, to give a crust of bread, but not recognize anything. Thank you.
Resuming debate uh, with the Honorable the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We must, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to take this opportunity to salute those members participating in this uh, great debate, especially on our side. The, uh, I'd like to congratulate the tenacity of our colleagues from Hunsik and uh, others who, for a few days now, this is the first time in this, I'm in this position, they've given me a lot of information on this matter, and of course, um, I use that to prepare my uh, speech on this. And I would also like to thank the member who introduced this motion, the Honourable Member for Laval Centre, and I would like to thank the uh, member for Verchères, the member for Verchères. Okay, um, where am I here? Uh, I'd like also, of course, to thank the people participating in this uh, great debate surrounding this uh, these terrible events from 1915 to 1923 during the First World War under the impulsion of the Ottoman Empire, these events which uh, made so many victims within the Armenian community and others in that area. Many atrocities were committed during those years and all of Europe, uh, Mideast and uh, Asia Minor uh, were affected. Millions of people were displaced by force and Many of them did not survive. Our government has many times expressed in this house and elsewhere its deep compassion for the Armenian people who suffered so much during that period. I'd like to quote a passage from the personal message addressed by the ex-Canadian Prime Minister of Armenian origin during the uh, 81st anniversary of the tragedy. Canada recognizes and deplores the fact that a great number of Armenians were killed during wars which uh, marked the end of the Ottoman Empire and uh, shows sympathy for the Armenian community. After the war, uh, many uh, displaced Armenians came to Canada and their contribution as well as that of their descendants has enriched uh, Canadian society very much. I hope that the uh, memory and souvenir of those uh, Past events will remind us uh, how important respect and diversity in this population of ours is. Debate on the Armenian tragedy in 1996, and as mentioned earlier, Mr. Speaker, this House adopted a motion recognizing the week of April 20th to April 27th each year as a week of remembrance of the inhumanity of people towards one another. And again, I emphasize that on June 10th, 1999, following comprehensive consultations, the position of the Government of Canada with regard to these events was clearly set out in a statement made in the House by the Honourable Member for Halton, speaking on behalf of the Foreign Affairs Minister. I would like to quote uh, from a reply by the Minister of Foreign Affairs in the House on April 18, 2002, to a question by our colleague, the Member from Brampton Centre, in which the Minister stated, as the Honourable Member will recall, the Government and the Prime Minister on many occasions have expressed the sympathy of our Government and our people for the tragedy that occurred to the Armenian people with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. That's the end of the quote. The Minister, of course, followed that with, we still urge that we would, should consider these tragic events in their historical context and remember that we must move forward and try to ensure peace and harmony among all people. These statements uh, make it clear that we remember the suffering caused by this painful period and attach a great deal of importance to ensuring that the memory of this human tragedy be preserved in our collective consciousness and passed on to future generations. Mr. Speaker, Canada has always been a land of hope for the millions of immigrants who have settled here and who continue, continue to do so in a spirit of renewal and reconciliation. It's extremely important to keep this concept in mind. Our diversity remains one of our country's greatest qualities, helping us not only to force to forge economic, political, and cultural links with the rest of the world, but also to project and promote our ideals and values such as tolerance, respect for human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. We are all working towards ensuring that these values are reflected in the work of international organizations and the tools to, to develop to prevent any recurrence of the horrors of the past and to uphold human rights. And we have highly, a highly credible voice in many countries and within international fora such as the United Nations and organizations for security and cooperation discussing the real possibility that people of different origins and cultures can live together in peace and security. The world, of course, listens to us because we speak knowledgeably of our own reality. Canada has steadfastly supported the development of international instruments to promote and uphold human rights and the rule of law. 
We are particularly proud of Canada's leadership role in promoting major international initiatives such as the Ottawa Convention on Landmines, international criminal court initiatives that are an integral part of Canada's global human security agenda. We attach great importance to establishing positive, comprehensive and, of course, productive relationships with and between all the countries of the region, including Turkey, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Indeed, a stable, prosperous region where reconciliation is triumph and mutual trust reigns could generate positive developments and spin-offs beyond the immediate borders of the countries concerned. Mr. Speaker, to place this issue in the context of a European dream, one characterized by reduced tensions and increasingly successful examples of peaceful solution to political problems, the relations between Armenia and Turkey are of a major concern. Again, I would like to underscore that we have learned that both Armenia and Turkey have begun negotiations to begin a process which will hopefully lead to the normalization of their relations, and we believe firmly it is vital to establish contact, dialogue and relations and where we can. This is why the Minister of Foreign Affairs wrote to the foreign ministers of, our, uh, of Armenia, Ar Azerbaijan and Turkey, encouraging dialogue and offering a willingness to play a supportive role. Now is not the time for the House to pass the motion, and this would only result in upsetting the ongoing dialogue between Armenia and Turkey. Mr. Speaker, I realize that uh, the motion that is brought forward is one that will pit members on a number of sides on, various, on, on a various poll, and I believe it's, it's important for us to take into consideration the good work that has been done by a lot of people who try to bring this forward. A famous Prime Minister once said that we must strive for justice. It's impossible to do it at all turns, but certainly the most important emphasis is justice in our own time. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'll be uh, splitting my time with the distinguished member from Calgary Southeast. Uh, no problem with the motion, but you, uh, you need a unanimous consent to do so. Well, unanimous consent to, uh, to share my time. Thank you. thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much to the to the assembled members today. No, and no. Uh, this is act. No, you need. A, I'm sorry. You need a unanimous consent to split your time during private members' hour. Are you? Are you asking for a unanimous consent? I, I'm no? asking for a unanimous consent, and I thought I had it. No. So do I have it? Yes. So I thought it. Is had there it. unanimous consent to table the motion? Yes. Well, I heard a no. The honourable member for Co Co Cumberland Colchester. Well, that's a little disappointing, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we, we can't share our time in this uh, in this uh, debate. But uh, anyway, uh, it's a. Uh, Kind of, it's disappointing because here in Canada we do try to resolve our differences by giving different points of view, and and, and we don't resort to uh, to uh, to uh, violence or, or military action, and and uh, this is just kind of a, it's a disappointing that this happened this way. But anyway, this is the third time that I have uh, spoken about this issue, and several times, and I, uh, it's over several years, and I want to compliment the member from Brampton Centre for raising it before, and also the member today for raising it again, because it's an issue that uh, certainly is, uh, means a lot to a lot of people. It uh, brings a lot of emotion and a lot of uh, sadness to people's hearts when, when you talk about it. And uh, I, I was just thinking that we, we were all moved in North America with the, with the disaster of September the 11th when several thousand people died. Here we're talking about a million and a half people. That's 250 times as many people were, were lost during this period from 1915 to 1923. And uh, it, is a, it, it was a catastrophe of monstrous proportions um, and, uh, that took place at the end of the, uh, of the Ottoman Empire and uh, involving World War I. But it's, we can only just possibly imagine what it's like for the Armenians to uh, grasp the situation when, when we've turned our whole continent inside out because of the September the 11th uh, uh, disaster that we experienced, when in fact it was only a, a, small, a small disaster relative to what they've gone through. But the whole debate surrounds a terrible massacre of human lives between 1915 and 1923 with estimates in excess of a million and a half men, women and children. 
there were there was violence and there were uh, deportations and internments and mass murders and all kinds of atrocities and we in this house can hardly imagine what went on so mr speaker uh, it's uh, it's good that we raise these issues and discuss them and raise public awareness of them and extend our sympathy to those uh, those that uh, still suffer and, uh, and and are torn over the over the awful uh, events we abhor any mass slaughter or killings, whether they're in Rwanda or, or the Middle East or Europe or by any country or any group. And it's important that we remember these issues and work towards uh, finding ways to prevent them. And we have a responsibility in Canada to, to do that now, and we have a responsibility to make sure that uh, atrocities in the past are not forgotten. We're very fortunate here the way we resolve our issues, and we have not been subject to anything like what those people in, in any of these disasters that I mentioned were, uh, were had to experience. So I think it's very important that we do uh, make sure that we do uh, we do everything we can to prevent them, as we are as we are in Afghanistan now, and uh, in other areas around the world. And it's certainly important that we keep the issues before the public so that uh, we will never forget these awful things that happen. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to end my, my comments with that. And uh, hopefully that these, these uh, debates that we've had, this is, again, the third one I've been involved with. And perhaps if I hadn't been involved with the debates, I never would have known anything about this. So I hope Canadians that are listening will, will take a lesson and learn about this uh, issue and, uh, and uh, give it a lot of thought. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Halifax. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise tonight to support this motion, acknowledging the Armenian Genocide 90 years ago, and secondly, to condemn that atrocity as a crime against humanity. I'd like to congratulate the member for Laval Centre for her initiative in proposing the motion this evening on this very important subject. And secondly, I'd like to commend uh, those citizens, and particularly Canadians uh, of Armenian descent, on continuing their struggle to obtain justice. As you know, my colleague for Burnaby Douglas also introduced repeatedly for 10 years a motion aimed at recognizing this fact. Uh, through the member of, uh, for Burnaby Douglas, the NDP has uh, called for April 24th uh, to be officially designated as a day of remembrance for the 1.5 million Armenians who fell victim to the first genocide of the 20th century. Now, Mr. Speaker, we've all heard false arguments for why Canada should not recognize this genocide. And I'm very sorry to say that uh, I think we heard one such uh, argument or set of arguments from the new Parliamentary Secretary for Foreign Affairs this evening, and I think that's regrettable. Uh, but the most common argument, the most common argument that one hears, Mr. Speaker, and I think we need a moment to consider this, is that uh, if this uh, recognition of the Armenian Genocide uh, were to be adopted by the Parliament of Canada, uh, that uh, Canada-Turkey relations would be adversely affected. Well, Mr. Uh, uh, Speaker, I suppose the same people who make that argument would have argued that we, Canada, should have plunged ourselves into the Bush's Iraqi war. Because one could say that, uh, you know, we might suffer some, might have suffered some retaliation. In fact, many would say we are suffering some retaliation. But, Mr. Speaker, it was an important stand of principle that this parliament, that the Canadian people took in, in opposing the illegal, unjustified war in Iraq. And it's time for us here in this parliament to take a similar principled stand in recognizing the Armenian Genocide. Mr. Speaker, I want to, to wrap up uh, briefly because I don't uh, wish to encroach on the time of other members. I, I want to briefly uh, wrap up by quoting uh, from the current president of the, national, the Armenian National Committee of Canada and again recognize the important ongoing work that has been done. 
contrary to the parliamentary secretary, who basically says, if I understood his comments, well, why don't we just let it go and move to the future? It has to be understood that people move on from such a brutalizing experience to their people and particularly family members and loved ones by being able to have an acknowledgement of the atrocities and then be able to leave it behind them. It's a psychological matter, it's a political matter, it's an historic question of justice. And let me say in conclusion, Mr. Speaker, quoting from uh, the very thoughtful submission from the Armenian National uh, Committee of Canada, the recognition of the historical fact of the Armenian genocide by a political body is a genuine expression of respect towards justice, respect towards the memory of the victims, respect towards their sons and daughters all over the world, including Canada. It's not an act of vengeance, as is often portrayed by the politicians of denial. It's not an act of obligation for restitution as sometimes professed by authorities of falsification. It's not an act that would create any hatred between communities as it is erroneously represented by the outside sources. It's merely an act of historic justice. It's time for Canada to add its name to the list of countries who have already done so, Mr. Speaker, and I hope we will do so here tonight. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Thunder Bay, Atacoke. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, <clears throat> I would like to let the uh, listening audience know that there certainly has been a change in the atmosphere in this chamber versus the kind of atmosphere we had two hours ago here, which is a clear indication to me and to everyone else that this is a very solemn occasion and a very sensitive one to all people that are involved today here in this chamber. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to tell everyone that in October 1995, I was fortunate to have visited Turkey. And why did I visit Turkey? Well, for a great number of reasons, I formed the Canadian-Turkish Parliamentary Friendship Group here, and <clears throat> was keenly interested in that country and hoping to develop more positive relationships with a country that I knew very little about, and most parliamentarians knew little about the country as well. Well, <clears throat> I would like to tell you that it was a highly organized and planned trip, one in which I had complete control in determining with whom I would meet, the topics of discussion, concerns, places to examine, from the highest levels of governmental and religious control to the bagel peddlers on the street. Without any doubt, Mr. Speaker, it was a fantastic learning experience. But before I left Canada, I did a lot of research and had the opportunity to meet with some Canadians of Armenian descent, leaders in the Armenian community. Well, I'll never forget that meeting because they did their very, very best to convince me not to visit Turkey because they presented to me a picture of a country where they claimed that human rights did not exist for the masses and where the Kurds were being persecuted daily. <clears throat> For instance, you know, the one story I remember so vividly that when anyone was caught speaking on a street or overheard in the bus or in a streetcar speaking the Kurdish dialect or one of the dialects, uh, and they were reported, they could be punished. Well, they told me quite a few others, but I'll continue with my presentation. Well, Mr. Speaker, I soon discovered that none of their horror stories were true. Mr. Speaker, the constitutional protocol of the Turkish government states, and I'm going to quote, Differences of languages, faith, and origin within our national culture enriches our cultural life. The natural prerequisite of a democratic social structure is that these differences can be expressed freely within the scope of national integrity." Unquote. Well, Mr. Speaker, 17 constitutional amendments were made early in 1995, introduced in democratic reforms in the human rights areas, the most important being freedom of speech, freedom of association, and freedom of assembly. Well, these reforms are working, for I found that there were 15 Kurdish newspapers, numerous books written in the Kurdish dialects, and today, 
Eight years later, the evidence is overwhelming with over 3,000 independent, not government controlled, but independent radio stations. And some are broadcasting in Kurdish dialect. Mr. Speaker, while visiting the, grand, the Turkish Grand National Assembly, which is their parliament, I discovered that over 100 members were sitting in that parliament were of Kurdish descent, such as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Hinkat Cetsten. With all the democratic improvements that have taken place in Turkey since 1995, and when I compare what they have with all the other countries surrounding Turkey, in near Turkey, I must say, and I firmly believe, that today Turkey stands out as the most secular and democratic state in the Middle East. During my first visit, I met many Canadians who had invested in economic projects in Turkey. From Montreal, the famous LaSalle College International Fashion School, whose graduates are found in many houses of fashion throughout the world. Netas, a giant telecommunication enterprise in Istanbul, a company which is 51% owned by Canada, Canadian Northern Telecom. I could go on and on, but there isn't time. I want to tell you that the highlight of my visit was visiting the enormous complex subway system that was in, under construction in Ankara, the capital city. Government officials, engineers and representatives from Bardier Incorporated and SNC Lavinen, Quebec companies, and a delegation of officials from Bombardier plant in Thunder Bay. Now, Thunder Bay is my riding, Mr. Speaker, where the subway cars that were bought by the, the Turkish government to ride on those new subway tracks in Ankara. Well, they took me on the first trial run of the cars and that system. In that trial run, I discovered that they were all highly impressed by the effectiveness of the system and by the superior workmanship revealed within the subway cars. Mr. Speaker, there is not enough time to deal with the economic uh, with relationships between Canadians and Turkish companies, but I have to tell you, I wish to point out that support and accepting these motions, for which there is absolutely no proof of a planned genocide, of Armenians would have disastrous economic effects on Canada's economy. At this very moment, pending the outcome of these motions, we could win or lose a billion dollar contract to have over 300 subway cars built in the Bombardier plant in Thunder Bay. Over 1,000 employees are involved mostly highly trained and skilled union members. Parts are manufactured in Thunder Bay, which involve a great number of other skilled workmen, and a great number of these parts and systems are manufactured in Quebec. Well, SNC Lavinen, major contributors to telecommunications and control systems for the subway, can also severe, be severely affected, which would mean a decrease in employment and in a number of employees that this company would have, not only in Ontario, but especially in Quebec. And Mr. Speaker, our ties with Turkey are growing in a very, very positive manner, and we must not jeopardize this beneficial growth in an emotional, reckless, foolhardy manner. I would like to say a word now about planned genocide. Mr. Speaker, the Ottoman Empire was comprised of 25 countries, and for many years turmoil, turmoil prevailed throughout certain regions, especially in eastern Anatolia and Armenia, which is in the far eastern section of what we now call Turkey today. Even before the Balkan War started in 1912, many were moving and leaving that area to safer havens. Prior to the 1912 British, prior to 1912, British, French, and Ottoman sources claim that the Ottoman, Ottoman Armenian population was somewhere between 1.05 million and 1.5 million. 
Historian Dr. Justi Justin McCarthy of the Univer University of Louisville, he was a British and British historian Arnold Toynbee, and Monsignor Touche, a, mi a French missionary, all calculated that the Armenians lost approximately 600,000 people from 1912 to 1920. Excuse me while I have a little sip of water. There, that feels better. However, during the same period, over two and a half million Muslims, including Turks, Kurds, and Tartans, died in Easter Anatolia. We have no idea how many Russians were killed. Mr. Speaker, the Armenian delegation to the Paris Peace Conference in 1920 declared that after the war, 280,000 Armenians remained in the Anatolian portion of the occupied Ottoman Empire, while 700,000 Armenians had emigrated to other countries, such as France, United States, Canada, where the majority went to Quebec, and Australia. Clearly, then, a great portion of the Adam Ottoman Empire of the Ottoman Armenians, Armenians were not killed as claimed. Mr. Speaker, each needless death is tragic. Equally tragic are, li are lies meant to inflame and perpetuate ethnic hatred. That is not the Canadian way. In conclusion, Mr. Speaker, I would like to quote from the, from the former Prime Minister Jean Chrétien and what he said on April the 24th, 2002, and I quote, let us be reminded of the importance of working together to eliminate intolerance and fanaticism wherever it appears and to promote reconciliation and cooperation among all peoples. That, Mr. Speaker, is the Canadian way. Debate, the Honourable Member for Calgary Southeast. Point of order, before I begin, what is the uh, scheduled rotation? There's been some uh, discussion about uh, changing it. Well, uh, at this point in time, I, uh, I try to alternate between uh, the government and uh, the opposition and uh, each and every party, if, if that is possible, because uh, right now, uh, in the rotation, it should be uh, an, a new, a conservative member, followed by a liberal, and this should bring us to 10 to 7, which is closing time. The Honourable Member for Calgary Southeast. Thank you. I will take the floor, but in recognition of my colleague from Bram Brampton, I'll, I'll be just a, a three or four minutes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, let me say that, uh, first of all, I've spoken on this motion, uh, similar motions, a couple of times, and I've put on the record what I think is a pretty compelling uh, and, and undeniable historical record. In my last intervention on this issue, I uh, began reading from headlines that appeared in Canadian media outlets during uh, 1915 and 1916, and I'd just like to continue citing uh, a few of these uh, that actually appeared, and I'd like the member from Thunder Bay to perhaps listen to what the Canadian media was reporting as objective news fact during the genocide. The London Free Press on October 22, 1915 said, headline, Armenian race may disappear before war ends. Uh, Vatican has appealed for unfortunate people. Um, the, Globe, the Globe newspaper, predecessor to the Globe and Mail, said on October 23, 1915, million Armenians wiped out by Turks. Only 200,000 Armenian inhabitants of Turkey now remain in country. The, um, uh, let me see, the, the Globe of Saturday 27, 1915, spoke of unspeakable cruelty uh, to the lot of Armenians, massacres of unsurpassing horror committed. People burned alive, torturing, beggaring, all descriptive language, practice on defenseless Christians, according to Viscount Bryce. The Ottawa Evening Journal on November 29th of 1915 reported a Saturnalia of slaughter by refined methods as young Turks set out to wipe Armenian race out of the world. The Ottawa Evening Journal of November 30, 1915, Crime of Belgium, venial sin, when Armenian massacre known to nations. These are headlines in the Canadian media of the era, Mr. Speaker. And finally, the Globe newspaper, December 15, 1915. Million Armenians massacred by Turks. Lord Bryce publishes further report of atrocities in Asia Minor. These are the accounts of Canadian journalists and their first-hand sources in the region at the time. This is not... Uh, some arcane debate between uh, historians on, on differing sides, Mr. Speaker. This is a, a, a recognized objective historical fact that cannot be denied. Let me move then briefly to 
the comments of the parliamentary secretary who continues to use the government's language of a tragedy. Oxford defines a tragedy as a serious accident or natural catastrophe, whereas it defines uh, a uh, genocide as the um, genocide as the mass extermination of human beings, especially of a particular race or nation. Now, Mr. Speaker, I believe that the historical fact is absolutely clear and undeniable that that is what occurred uh, during the First World War in, the, uh, in that region. There was a deliberate attempt by, as, as an element of the uh, then Ottoman government, to destroy the Armenian people. And I believe, just as, as the Western world has recognized the reality of the Holocaust to learn from those the terrible historical lessons of that era, so too must we learn from the first great genocide of the last century. Let me say in closing, because I know I want to give time to my colleague from Brampton, that um, I have many friends in the Turkish-Canadian community, and I've, been, I've had representations made to me by the excellent uh, uh, Turkish ambassador to Canada and by the Turkish consul in Calgary and other members of that community. And I believe the passage of this motion should in no way, shape, or form cast any kind of cloud over the marvelous contribution made to Canada by, by Turkish immigrants to this country. And in, nor should it in any way inhibit our fantastic relationship with our NATO ally and, and as aspiring European Union member in Turkey. Mr. Speaker, I reject categorically the notion that the acceptance of the historical reality of the genocide will in any way inhibit our relationship with Turkey. I believe in that relationship. I am a fan of, of Turkey as a, as a uh, Muslim country that is seeking to lead the way in terms of democracy uh, and human rights. Yes, it's imperfect. Yes, it needs to make improvements in many areas in terms of minorities, but it is, it is so much further ahead of many countries in that region. We need to, to con continue to build on that relationship, and we, we need to, to ensure that the Turks in Canada do not feel that this motion in any way places any culpability on the Turkish people. We, Mr. Speaker, that is a, simply a red herring. So in closing, I want to say on behalf of, I think, the vast majority of members in my party that we ought to recognize the historical reality so that our grandchildren and their grandchildren will know that this, that this was at one of the, the, great, the first great genocide, and we must recognize it in our history if we are to prevent these sorts of things from reoccurring in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Brampton Centre. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. First of all, I'd like to thank my colleague from, Bra from uh, Laval uh, for presenting this motion. This, was not, this is not the first, this will, this will not be the last. Uh, I hope it will be the last because we'll vote on this and we'll pass through because we have to go on debating other issues uh, in this House to do with the Armenian-Turkish relationship. But I hope uh, we support this motion and go forward from here. But I want to, before I say my peace, Mr. Speaker, I want to reflect on the comments made by my colleague from Thunder Bay. He mentioned uh, that Turkey is ready to join the European Union. Well, that false statement, Mr. Speaker, because Turkey tried for the last 30, 40 years to join. Every time they were blocked for many reasons. One of them was the human rights of Turkish government against minority. Second, Kurdish minority treatment. Third, the Armenian genocide issue. The fourth was Cyprus issue. Turkey, if it does not address the four issues, Mr. Speaker, Turkey will never be a European Union country. Second, I think my colleague mentioned, Mr. Speaker, that the fact that Turkish constitution is such a fantastic instrument. Well, he may be right. Turkish constitution was written after the genocide. And there is no constitution in the world. Even Hitler's constitution did not provide for genocide after, after Jews. Rwanda constitution or Bosnian constitution, this constitution, they never provide class say, let's kill a minority. These things are done, Mr. Speaker, in the name of national security. Turkey at the time felt Armenians were threat to their national security. Let's eliminate them. Let's solve, give them final resolution and get over with. My colleague from NDP mentioned about Iraq, uh, Iraq, US, and Canada. She's 100% right. If we can afford to, quote, unquote, upset the USA, that we do about $1 billion trade a day. With Turkey, our trade is, uh, is with Canada, Turkey trade has happened two years, $1 billion. So if you can provide, if you can provoke U.S. in this condition, what's the big deal about provoking, so-called provocation, of course, with Turkey? Of course, we know this whole thing is a hot air. When France passed the resolution uh, a few years ago, U.S. Uh, uh, Turkish ambassador moved from 
uh, was recalled from Paris to Ankara six months after he went back. They said they're going to cancel the contract. No contract will cancel. So this, this argument is totally, totally false. Also, my colleague from Thunder Bay mentioned the fact that the SNC Land and, uh, uh, and the Canadian government are involved with the contract with the Turkish government to provide 300 some odd trains. Mr. Speaker, I've been there long enough, especially on this issue for 25, 30 years. If you recall, three years ago, there were discussions Turkey is going to buy Kandu reactor from us. Well, you know what? Every time there's a motion in this House that this issue is close to settlement or final resolution of this issue, Turkey come up with so-called memorandum of understanding. Well, if anybody believes that Turkey is going to buy these trains from Bombardier, well, good luck. I mean, you're really naive to believe Turkey is going to pay for this. First of all, they have no money to pay for their own daily expenses. How would they afford to pay so much money for this kind of fantastic service? Bombardier should know better that this company is being used to provoke Canadian government to take a stand against the Armenian uh, question. Mr. Speaker, it was mentioned earlier also that we owe it to ourselves the histo history to recognize this. This is not to do with the current the Turkish government. I think at the end of the day, relations between Turkey and Armenia, those two countries, will improve because this issue is out of the way. So far, Mr. Speaker, I have the list of uh, all of the countries start with the uh, Swiss, the most recent one, I'd like to read for the record, Swiss government, October, December 16, 2003, Canadian Senate, June 13, 2002, uh, Council of European Parliament Assembly, April 24, 2001, Italian Chamber of Deputies, uh, Lebanese Parliament, French National Assembly, Belgian Senate, U.S. House of Representatives, Argentine Senate, European Parliament, French law, January 29, 2001, European Parliament again, French National Senate, Swedish Parliament, Council of European Parliament, Lebanese Parliament, Hellenic Parliament, Russian Duma, European Parliament, Cyprus Parliament, Uruguay, and, Mr. Speaker, 1915, there was joint declaration of France, Great Britain, and Russia on April 20, May 24, 1915, to condemn what happened to the Armenians. Further, Mr. Speaker, my colleague from Calgary, uh, Calgary, uh, from Calgary Center, I believe, I spoke, uh, read a few pages of a book. I have in my possession here a newspaper's article of uh, Evening Telegram, miscellaneous, The Globe, uh, t t Times London, and New York Times. Also, I have in my possession, Mr. Speaker, all this resolution I read earlier, about 40, 50 pages passed through the parliaments of Canada, Canada, states, European Parliament, everything. I'd like to ask unanimous consent of the House to leave this document with the clerk for their further study. So, Speaker, can I have unanimous consent to can I have unanimous consent to table these documents, Mr. Speaker? So, can I have these documents? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, we began, I remember debating this issue way back. I remember a few years ago, we had created this party some 30, 40 years ago. They raised this issue. Sorry. Just a moment, please. I'd like to clarify with the honorable member, because we're not sure what you're doing here. I'd like to table, Mr. Speaker, the documents I mentioned earlier. I have cl clippings from Evening Telegram, clipping from... New York Times, London Times, and uh, Globe newspapers that speaks about the issue documents as of the time they were printed, not edited, just historical facts as they were written 1915. So does the honorable member have uh, unanimous consent to table the motion? Agreed. Does the honourable member uh, as uh, to adopt the motion? Agreed. Yes. Agreed in so order. But you said about five hundred minutes of document, Mr. Member Mr. Speaker. I'm sure Center. anybody who wants to study this historic fact, we get lots of facts here and undisputed facts in this uh, presentation. As I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, earlier, creditors probably they were the first political party in the House of Commons to raise this issue of Armenian genocide in the 1960s. Since then. 
70s and 80s, we passed many resolutions here, many esoteric ones to bring the issue to focus in the Canadian public. I have to say, the issue was quite forceful and brought many, many point of views how to solve this problem. I'm glad that our parliament, in the past uh, 10 years at least, we passed many resolutions. One of them, Mr. Speaker, was passed earlier, three couple of years ago, by the Senate, which asked government and Parliament of Canada to recognize the genocide as a historic event. Second one, Mr. Speaker, we passed nine to seven votes, I believe, by Foreign Affairs Committee. It was a historic day for us. Foreign Affairs Committee of Canada accepted the fact that, that this House of Commons must recognize genocide and pass on this resolution to the government of Canada. I like to read that, that motion we passed, that the committee invites the House of Commons to recognize the genocide of the Armenians, which began at the turn of the last century by the Ottoman Turks during the First World War. Mr. Speaker, we also, we also passed resolution, as was mentioned earlier, 1996, declaring April 20 to 27 as a week of man's humanity to his fellow, fellow man. What is important in this, in this, Mr. Speaker, that we got continue this, uh, this struggle, not only for the Armenian sake, not only for the Turkish sake, or whatever case may be, but we have to continue this, Mr. Speaker. It's vital to recognize the historical fact. This step, Mr. Speaker, when we take a positive step on it, it will help bring about these two nations together forever. They live together like the Mr. Speaker. Armenia is there. Turkey is there. Armenia is not about to vanish. Turkey will not be vanished. So it's better off that we do our part, bring them together, recognize this case, and move on forward for their peace, security, and prosperity of both Armenians and Turks. Thank you very much for your cooperation, Mr. Speaker. The time provided for the study of private members' business has now expired, and the order drops to the bottom of the order of priority on the order paper, and it being 6.50, the House will now adjourn until tomorrow, 10 a.m., pursuant to Standing Order 21. As it is uh, 5.56, the House will now proceed to private members' business according to the today's order paper. Private members' business, motion M380, standing in the name of Ms. Dalton Giral regarding the Armenian genocide. Resuming debate, the Honorable Member for Mercier. Thank you. Please uh, let me know when I have two minutes left. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, tomorrow will be the first time that members can vote on this important issue, even if though it's the fourth time that a similar motion has tabled in this House. I was surprised to see among my mail a letter from the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Trade addressed to members and joining us not to vote for this motion, this private member's motion. And quite frankly, I was somewhat surprised and angry since he is one of the ministers in this government who see, says that he gives great importance to what members want. So I was surprised. But Secondly, after having read his letter, I congratulated myself for him having sent it. I'll tell you why. In the third paragraph, he says this. The government's established policy was stated in a statement in the House in June 1999 regarding reconciliation and quotes within quotes here, we remember the massacre of the Armenian population that took place in 1915. This tragedy had been provoked in order to eliminate a national group 
hundreds of thousands of Armenians were victims of all sorts of atrocities, including massive deportations and collective murder. Mr. Speaker, whoever has read the definition of genocide in the Convention on Genocide understands that all the elements of a genocide are very clearly recalled in the minister's statement here because his definition says it's an act committed with the intention of destroying in whole or in part a national group, an ethnic, racial or religious group. That is what we just heard from the mouth, or rather the pen, of the minister. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to recall this motion, and I congratulate my um, colleague for Laval Centre for having tabled it. What does the motion say? That this House acknowledge the Armenian Genocide of 1915 and condemn this act as a crime against humanity. There are new elements that enable us to be even more in favor of this motion. The first thing, first point is this. A decision was made recently at the Hague International Tribunal which ruled on Mr. Vladik's defense, I always have some trouble pronouncing his name, he maintained that the fact that he was found responsible for the deaths of seven to 8,000 Muslims in July 1995 was not sufficient. Seven to 8,000 people killed, but that wasn't sufficient to call it a genocide. The Hague certified that this defense was not valid and recognized that this was indeed a genocide. I believe this decision, which according to experts broadens the concept of genocide, is something that we can understand and find important. And something else that might be interesting, the New York Times the newspaper that is so well respected by so many. This newspaper recently changed its guidelines for its journalists and editorial writers. I don't have it in French. It's the New York Times, so I'll have to read it in English. study of scholarly definitions of genocide, we have decided to accept the term in references to the Turks' mass destruction of Armenians in and around 1915. And, the and further, an Armenian genocide may be used freely and should not be qualified with phrasing like what Armenians call and so forth. C'est donc un autre élément. This is another important element in the Boston Globe had done the same thing a year earlier. Now, there are questions. How can we recognize that the 1999 statement by the Minister of Foreign Affairs represents a, a genocide? Why not say that what he said means that there was a genocide? Why do we, do we not acknowledge this? This is the same as the definition. And why would this threaten any relations between Turkey and Canada or Canadian citizens of Turkish origin and others? A threat has been made, but nothing has come of it while in various assemblies in various countries, and they've been named repeatedly, have adopted a similar resolution. So how could this motion attack Turkey? The word Turkey isn't even stated, contrary to the motion that was 
a table at the House of Representatives in the United States. The word Turkey is not here. So can we not state that Mustafa Kemal, the one who founded the Republic of Turkey in 1923, and this genocide goes back to 1915, on numerous occasions he condemned the massacres. The massacres didn't take place in a closet. And he said on numerous occasions that they were infamy and that the guilty must be punished. And in 1923, the Republic of Turkey was created. To Turks today and those in previous years could have said, well, it was the Ottoman Empire. It was a moment of crisis. We sympathize with the Armenians and we recognize that they were victims of a genocide. Why would they act differently? The word genocide, I might add, Mr. Speaker, if we don't find it before 1948 is because it wasn't used for that reason or for those purposes. And I looked in my old Larousse dictionary going back to 1932, and the word genocide, and this is interesting as a historian, genocide means the, use, the word used by those who defend the Choa, and there is no good reason, therefore, to vote against the motion that we will have to vote on tomorrow. I've already stated that, that there was a definition given by the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We would simply have to add what is described as the Armenian Armenian Genocide and the National Assembly in Quebec and many other legislative assemblies and the Senate in harsher forms adopted this motion. But is it not necessary to recognize this for the descendants of the men and the women whose suffering was so great? Is it not? And was it not recognized at the time by a number of witnesses? We need only to do a little research to determine this. So why would the fact that we vote for this motion delay uh, any uh, bringing uh, Turkey and Armenia any closer? And the recognition of the CHOA did not prevent an extraordinary rapprochement between Europe and Germany. The future cannot be built on what is forgotten, and the future, we believe, must be built on the respectful acknowledgment of these facts that are considered as facts by those who have examined these issues. And as to reconciliation, yes, we will have to turn and look towards the future once the past can rest in peace. The uh, point of order, the Honorable uh, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Justice. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I was wondering if uh, I would like to ask the colleague who moved the motion, because I need the consent of the Honorable Member to adopt this motion, or to put the motion, and I'll read it in English. To amend the motion by substituting it with the following, that this House remember the calamity affli afflicted on the Armenian people in 1915. This tragedy was committed with the intent to destroy a national group in which hundred hundreds of thousands of Armenians were subject to atrocities, which included massive deportations and massacres. May the memory of this period contribute to healing wounds as well as to reconciliation of present-day nations and communities and remind us all of our collective duty to work together towards world peace. No, no, no. no. The Honourable Member for Laval Centre, on a point of order, I would imagine that I must accept or reject this, and I would say that this is a parliament where we have two official languages, and I find it unacceptable 
that this amendment was not drafted in both French and English in view of the absolutely extraordinary resources that the government has at its disposal and that the honorable member has uh, to have this translated. I understood what was said, and it is clear that with or without translation, I regret, but I cannot agree with this amendment and include it in my motion. I believe that the problem has just been settled. Honorable the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Human Resources and uh, skills, de skills development. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Vrai. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is a great honor for me to speak once again in this House today to support this important motion that has been introduced by my colleague, and I am delighted to see that the Armenian cause has uh, progressed during the time that I've been in the House. Motions that have been presented in the House of Commons urging parliamentarians to recognize the Armenian genocide because I truly believe that we must all seek to do good by recognizing a wrong and speaking against it. More importantly, however, I chose to speak today because I wish to assure the survivors of the Armenian genocide who I have personally met in Montreal and in my constituency and I want to make sure that they leave this life knowing that people like us, parliamentarians in this House of Commons, are fighting for recognition and closure to the horrors they lived and witnessed firsthand and that have haunted them all their lives. I have looked into their eyes, Mr. Speaker, and all they're asking for is for us to acknowledge what happened and to call it by its rightful name, the Armenian Genocide. We want to assure them that the Turkish government will recognize the Armenian genocide and other atrocities and move towards reconciliation, which we all want in the future. The 20th century saw two world wars as well as a multitude of historic conflicts. Notwithstanding that, crimes against humanity are not an atrocity of the past but continue to be the daily lot of so many countries that impose torture, slavery, and massive deportation on their civilian population. On a day-to-day -day basis, we are witnesses of the persecution of minorities based on differences of political opinions, race, or religion. ...of inhumanity continue, despite the fact that the Geneva Convention condemns such actions. Even though the international community has admitted that these acts should not be practiced, we are still a long way from achieving this goal. Present events attest to similar acts and cry out for our vigilance. The Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunal designated specifically to prosecute high-ranking Nazis for the atrocity that had occurred during World War II tried for the first time those guilty of committing crimes against humanity. These crimes were defined in Article 6 of the London Charter and included murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed against any civilian population before or during the war or persecution on political racial and religious grounds. While not all criminals have been tried, the international community recognizes the Holocaust and commemorates it every year, as we do in Canada, as we did last week, Mr. Speaker, so that everyone around the world will remember this tragedy to ensure that it will never occur again. Regardless of this, we still live in a world where ethnic cleansing is practiced, the most recent examples, of course, being Yugoslav the former Republic of Yugoslavia and Rwanda. These atrocities are examples of crimes against humanity, but unfortunately, there have been many others in the past, and that is still the case today. Some are well known, others, such as the catastrophe in Asia Minor 1922, are less well known. At the end of the First World War, about two million Greek, Greeks inhabiting the region of Asia Minor on the western coast of Turkey. Uh, they lived there for more than 3,000 years. In 1922, these people, and just like the Armenians and other minorities, were victims of the first ethnic cleansing of the 20th century. For the First World War is perhaps the most vivid example of genocide as an instrument of national policy by the Ottoman Turks. What makes the Armenian Genocide such a particular example is that unlike the genocide of the Jewish people that took place during the Second World War, the international community did not try the war criminals or even formally acknowledge that the massacre took place. 
The United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide describes genocide as, and I quote, acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group, end of quote. Clearly, this definition applies in the case of the atrocities committed against the Armenians. Because the UN Convention was adopted in 1948, 30 years after the Armenian Genocide, Armenians worldwide have sought from their respective governments formal acknowledgement of the crimes committed during World War I. Con countries like France, Argentina, Greece, and Russia, Sweden, Italy, and Belgium have officially recognized the Armenian Genocide. On November 28, 2003, the National Assembly of Quebec adopted a motion proclaiming the day to commemorate the Armenian Genocide, introduced by my provincial member and, and colleague, Mr. Ivan Bordelot, and I would like to thank him for the work he's done over these years. Armenian cause, we are reminding the international community that these types of tragic historical events cannot simply be forgotten or denied. It is my hope that the international community as a whole will take the necessary steps to condemn these horrible acts of inhumanity and recognize the atrocities committed by the Ottoman Turks for what they are, a genocide. Many countries, including Italy, France, and Israel, have adopted parliamentary decrees or orders recognizing officially the Armenian Genocide. important to recognize an event that occurred over 80 years ago. We must always remember that those who disregard history are condemned to repeat it. Just think if the international community had reacted to this as it should have at the time. Would the atrocities of the Second World War ever have taken place? Perhaps not. During a debate in the House of Commons, the former Secretary of State reiterated the position of the Government of Canada for Central and Eastern Europe and the Middle East, stating, and I quote, We remember the calamity afflicted on the Armenian people in 1915. This tragedy was committed with the intent to destroy a national group in which hundreds of thousands of Armenians were subject to atrocities, which included massive deportations and massacres. May the memory of this period contribute to healing wounds as well as to reconciliation of present-day nations and communities and remind us all of our collective duty to work towards world peace." End of quote. Although the federal government recognizes the genocide as a, quote, calamity and tragedy, many parliamentarians, including myself, do not agree with this position and continue to work towards the recognition of the genocide. I truly believe that by working together we can and will accomplish our goal of recognition of the Armenian Genocide of the Government of Canada and eventually the Government of Turkey. For this reason, I have been working closely with the Armenian community in Canada and with my colleagues from the House of Commons and the Senate to convince Canadian, the Canadian Government my government to recognize the Armenian Genocide. And I do it for those survivors and I do it for my constituents and all Canadians of uh, Armenian origin. Years of work and concentrated efforts resulted in significant breakthroughs in 2002 for the Armenian cause, starting with the first ever Canadian parliamentary visit to Armenia in May 2002. I was honored to have had the opportunity to visit Armenia as a member of the delegation formed by the Canada-Armenia Parliamentary Friendship Group. My colleague, the Member of Parliament for Brampton Centre, who is a Canadian of Armenian origin, born in Aleppo, Syria, has been the leading champion of this cause in the House and I want to congratulate him again. This trip reinforced my already firm commitment to this cause, having had the opportunity to visit Yerevan, a museum commemorating the victims of the Armenian Genocide, and to meet with several Armenian political representatives or colleagues. This parliamentary exchange was reciprocated, of course, by a visit to Canada last fall. The Senate of Canada passed a motion on June 13, 2002, that was presented by my colleague and friend, the Honorable Shirley Mayer calling on the Canadian government to officially recognize genocide rather than just calling the event a crime against humanity or atrocity, as was the case in the former resolution of the House of Commons. Another very important step towards the recognition of the Armenian genocide came when the House of Commons Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs passed a historic motion on November 27, 2002, calling on the House of Commons to recognize the Armenian genocide. The member for Brampton Centre passed this motion that reads as follows, that the committee invite the House of Commons to recognize the genocide of Armenians, which began at the turn of the last century by the Ottoman Turks during the First World War. And we have 
done other things over the years to bring this issue to the forefront and make our colleagues recognize the importance of bringing resolution to this issue. I invite all members of Parliament. I certainly will be voting for it. I'm very proud also in my writing to have a monument to the Armenian genocide, to all genocides in fact, in the writing of Ohensik, which was uh, constructed by the City of Montreal. And I urge all my colleagues to support this very honourable effort by the member who uh, unfortunately will be leaving us in this House. And I encourage all our colleagues to let justice be done and recognize a wrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Resuming debate with the Honourable Member for Okanagan, Kokehala. Mr. Speaker, in addressing this question today, it's, it's uh, important first, uh, as we look at what, what this was and what took place, that we're clear on what this was not. And, and what, as a matter of fact, uh, the motion today, I'd like to be clear on, in my view, what this is not. This motion is not a demand for reparations. This motion is not a demand for veg vengeance. As a matter of fact, it would decry uh, vengeance and those wanting to somehow uh, retaliate in, in, in any way. Mr. Speaker, when we look at uh, horrific events down uh, through history, we recognize that we have to be part of a reconciliation process. And uh, if we look even at the Second World War, I reflect on the fact of my uh, grandfather, one of my grandfathers served, both grandfathers served, but one of my grandfathers serving in the Second World War was uh, captured as a Hong Kong veteran, went through four years of torture. And a matter of fact, never fully recovered from that torture and eventually died as a result of it. And for that reason, I never had the joy of meeting him. And yet, I cannot be part of a process of ongoing vengeance and anger. I have to be part of a process that somehow moves on to reconciliation and to forgiveness. So this is not a demand for vengeance and, and retaliation. It is not, Mr. Speaker, this motion is not a denunciation of the people of Turkey today or of the government of Turkey. And I know there are sensitivities around that from those who represent that government. In reading uh, the report, which a committee of this House, the Foreign Affairs Committee, just did related to Muslim nations. As a matter of fact, we give uh, commendation in our recommendations to the government of Turkey today, saying Canada should encourage the government of Turkey to be a voice of democracy and, and moderation within the Muslim world and to continue to implement its democratic and human rights reforms. And so we, we recognize that, uh, Mr. Speaker. This uh, republic developed after 1923 under... Uh, uh, Ataturk, under, uh, uh, under his uh, Mustafa Kemal, actually was his name, and he was renamed Ataturk, father of the Turks. The Islamic Caliphate at the time was abolished in 1923. A modern state began to develop, albeit a one-party state. But after the Second World War, developing into a two-party state, becoming, the, uh, incidentally, the first uh, and, and only Muslim nation to become a member of NATO, Many things to be congratulated about this particular uh, government today. As a matter of fact, one of our other recommendations is that their Prime Minister, Recep Erdogan, visit Canada and address the Parliament among, uh, to tell us about other matters, uh, among other matters, strengthening ties with country, countries of the Muslim world. And so when I had discussions with the Ambassador from Turkey, I tried to put uh, to allay concerns that he would have that this is any kind of reflection upon those people and upon that government. It is not, Mr. Speaker. But it is important, Mr. Speaker, it must be addressed what happened and it must be called what it was. What it was. We can't look for euphemistic terms for something that was nothing other than genocide. 126 Holocaust scholars and, and historians said in their verdict, March 7, 2000, I quote, the World War I Armenian genocide is an incontestable historical fact and accordingly we urge, this is what they said, urge the governments of Western democracies to likewise recognize it as such. The International Association of Genocide Scholars, June 13, 1997, said that this reaffirms, they reaffirm that the mass murder of Armenians in Turkey in 1915 is a case of genocide which conforms to the statutes of the United Nations Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of Genocide. Mr. Speaker, Professor Roger Smith is the Professor of Government of the uh, College of William and Mary. He's a historian and he's past president of the Association of Genocide Scholars. He said, indeed, there is now a consensus among scholars that the Armenian Genocide, which was the first large-scale genocide in the 20th century, is the prototype of much of the geno genocide that has occurred since 1945. 
and he says some of the patterns found in the Armenian case have appeared again and again in the 20th century. Various world leaders, Ronald Reagan as President of the United States, uh, during his term said, like the genocide of the Armenians before it. He refers to the genocide, Mr. Speaker, of, of the Armenians. Gerald Ford, past President of the United States, also talked, in his words, I use them, with mixed emotions, marking the 50th anniversary of the Turkish genocide of the Armenian people. Winston Churchill recognized it, Mr. Speaker, and talked about that, uh, the, the, that infamous, infamous time in history, and Mustafa Kemal Ataturk himself recognized it, commented on it. Mr. Speaker, the uh, Mustafa Arif Interior Minister in 1918, this is the Interior Minister himself, 1918 to 19, said, unfortunately, our wartime leaders, imbued with the spirit of brigandage, carried out the law of deportation in a manner that could surpass the proclivities of the most bloodthirsty bandits. They decided to exterminate the Armenians, and they did exterminate them. He makes an important point going on saying the decision was taken by the Central Committee of the Young Turks, was implemented by the government, and the atrocities committed against the Armenians reduced our country to a gigantic slaughterhouse. That's the Interior Minister of the day, 1918-1919. Mr. Speaker, why then do we pursue this? This happened, it took place at the time. There was not only the, the atrocious massacres, we've heard in great detail the atrocities that took place, the, the, uh, the death marches, the massacres, the rapes, in many cases the forced conversion to Islam. The, at, at the time, at the day, Mr. Speaker, these were headlines in the British and United States press. Books were written at the time, books are still being written today. A Canadian has made a movie about this, Ararat. Our own uh, Adam Egoyan has made a movie on it. A bestseller recently on the New York Times um, best-selling list, The Burning Tigress, written by Peter Balakian. In great detail, since those times, since the headlines of the day, Mr. Speaker, this was detailed. It's interesting, Mr. Speaker, there was an awareness then in the United States and around the world that this was happening. It actually led to a, a huge response. People were responding. People were trying to send funds. People were trying to, to find ways of, of uh, intervening. But n the intervention did not take place, Mr. Speaker. And I want to look at that, that fact that the world knew at the time, it was making headlines at the time, people were shocked at the time, and yet an intervention did not take place because there was a sense it was happening within a sovereign state. Mr. Speaker, I would suggest that the importance of recognizing this genocide is to also help us today to grapple with this question of when is it legitimate for peace-loving nations of the world to stop a genocide that's happening in another sovereign state. As much as we recognize the importance of nation states, is there a point at which there should be an intervention to stop a genocide? We still grapple with that question. We could not, the world could not grapple successfully with the question in the killing fields of Cambodia. Mr. Speaker, we've just recently seen the anniversary of what happened in Rwanda, a heartbreaking, a heartbreaking, sh uh, shattering, event that took place with our own general there trying to send out a word and a warning that, that, that intervention was needed. Peace-loving nations still have not been able to grapple with this, with this difficulty and with this problem. In the Sudan today, untold, untold atrocities are taking place and we still struggle. Part of it, Mr. Speaker, has to do with the defining and the acceptance of the very fact that human beings at times though we find this hard to accept, are capable of genocide, that groups of human beings could actually do this. Maybe, Mr. Speaker, because I try and be optimistic about human nature, and I say, how could these things happen? How could it have happened to the Armenians? How could these things happen to others? Of course, the, we just celebrated, if I can use that word, the most atrocious event ever in the 20th century or throughout history, the Holocaust itself. Part of it, I believe, Mr. Speaker, is our lack of reluctance as human beings to accept that human beings could do this to one another. But we must accept it. Accepting it equips us to identify it as it happens again in the course of human history and impels us to action to possibly prevent it from happening again. That's why it's so important that this is recognized, Mr. Speaker. That's why it must be called for what it was, a genocide to equip us and to alert us to the fact, Mr. Speaker, that it can happen, that human beings indeed can do these things to one another. 
Mr. Speaker, we need to stand as members of Parliament in this place and recognize this motion, not using euphemisms, but using the word calling it for what it was, a genocide, Mr. Speaker. And perhaps then, when somebody sounds a future alarm, as Henry Morgenthau did, the ambassador to Turkey at the time in 1913, when he sounds the alarm, we're aware that it has happened. We're aware that it could happen again. And the deaths, the, the, the incredible numbers of deaths, up to 1.5 million, will not have been in vain, Mr. Speaker, that those people who were massacred, those people who were targeted for extermination, that their lives and their deaths, by us calling it what it was today, can serve, hopefully, to honor what they went through, but also to prevent future atrocities happening. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, colleague, Colleagues, I have a list of four speakers and potentially a fifth speaker who would seek the floor to speak on this motion. I know that the chair is not able to ask or rather to ask you to limit your remarks to five minutes each, but insofar as possible, could I ask you if it were possible to limit your com comments to be brief and I will try to recognize as many members as possible. So resuming debate. For Sackville, Muscadabit Valley, Eastern Shore. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I just wanted to, to remind the House and for all those people listening, if you want to, uh, if this House of Parliament wants to deal with the issue, then let's have the vote on it now and move it forward. Mr. Speaker, I have information here in front of me that the Ontario Legislature in 1980, 1980 was discussing this. The Assembly of National, uh, the National Assembly in Quebec in April of 80 also was discussing this. Mr. Speaker, the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada in July 23, 1984, and I quote from Mr. Stevens, we will make representation to the General Assembly of the United States, United Nations to recognize and condemn the Armenian genocide and to express abhorrence of such actions. That was back in 1983. The Liberal Party of Canada in 1984. The Liberal Party advocates setting aside a special day once a year in recognition of events such as the Armenian genocide. The NDP party in December 1989, Mr. Speaker, spoke about this. And, Mr. Speaker, it goes on and on. Now here we are in 2004, still speaking about it. And today, Mr. Speaker, if, if a person wasn't following the debate, they'd be very confused about what's happening. I have a letter here from the ambassador of Turkey, and here in one of the paragraphs he says this, and I quote, The truth about what happened between Turks and Armenians is there in the history for clear minds to study. The very fact that our Armenians are so persistent to have the House adopt the motion to attest that their history was genocide is indeed a testimony that it was not. That's a quote right out of his paper. Then I have a letter from the Armenian National Committee of Canada. I am convinced of your response and you've always shown general understanding of the historical fact of the Amer Armenian genocide. We ask that you give precious support for Bill M380. And then, Mr. Speaker, we have another letter from the Minister of, of um, Foreign Affairs that says, be careful what we do. So we've got one side saying don't, we have another side saying yes, we have someone in the middle saying be careful what you do. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, I've spoken to the Honourable Member from Brampton, and I know that this debate must be a very emotional time for him and his family and his ancestry. And Mr. Speaker, I also have my wife's aunt is married to an Armenian in Sacramento, California. And a few years ago, I spoke to him about this very issue. And he, Mr. Speaker, said, I don't believe I'll ever live to see a day when, when the current country of Turkey recognizes what happened back in 1915. And Mr. Speaker, I say very clearly, we have to call this for what it was. It was a genocide, the mass slaughter of a bunch of wonderful people were killed for whatever reason they were killed for. We can go into that debate till the cows come home. But they were murdered and slaughtered. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, nobody is blaming the current Turkish government for what happened in 1915. All we're doing in this House of Commons is recognizing that the event, the tragedy, took place. We're calling it very clearly what it is. And, Mr. Speaker, the reason we're doing that is so that we can do the following. 
There was a poem written by Lauren, I, I, I forget the proper way to say it, Shirinan and Alan Whitehorn. And it says very clearly, and Mr. Speaker, I say this because this poem says a lot. Mr. Speaker, my parents, where I was born in Holland, my parents and oldest brother were liberated by the Canadian sacrifices when at that time the Nazi regime of Germany did some terrible atrocities to the people of Europe and for that matter to the Jewish people as well. And we just, again, remember it had a day of remembrance for the Jewish Holocaust. And Mr. Speaker, when groups of people are out there in the world today and they are being harassed or slaughtered or killed or, or in any way defamed because of their nationality, of their religion, of their ethnicity, or whatever there is, Mr. Speaker, then we as parliamentarians in Canada have to stand up against that. And the reason why, Mr. Speaker, we have to remember the genocide for the following poem. We must remember, remember and learn, remember and tell, but also remember and live. And this line, Mr. Speaker, is the most important. And then someday, remember and forgive. Mr. Speaker, that little poem, I think, summarizes this entire debate. Mr. Speaker, we offer recognition to the Armenians, those survivors. We probably don't have many of them left, but there, there are children that are here that know the stories and their ancestors, so that we can say once and for all, we remember what it was. We remember what happened, so that we can prevent these types of atrocities from ever happening again. And no one, Mr. Speaker, in this House or anyone else that I have referred to are in any way insinuating that the current Turkish government is responsible for what happened. We're just offering our assistance to the Turkish government and to the Armenian people to get together, to bury the hatchet, as they say, and to work towards a common and lasting peace so that, Mr. Speaker, someday we'll remember and forgive. God bless you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member for Saskatoon, Wanuskewin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's uh, kind of with a heavy heart as we're in this place today discussing uh, events, uh, very difficult, very sad and tragic events uh, occurring back in 1915, the earlier part of the, the last century. And I guess uh, very troubling to me in the fact that we want to uh, bring conflicts from abroad in a very calculated, deliberate manner into this place here. I've always had a bit of a concern about bringing some of the ethnic clashes in other parts of the world into this place here, be it from Sierra Leone or wherever it happens to be, and that we, we do it here without the careful kind of uh, thought and attention we should uh, is, is a somewhat troubling thing. And the fact that it occurred so many, many years ago when there are uh, uh, things that occur in history at that time that are in dispute. You have two different sides of it. And also what we tend to see here most often, of course, on this particular issue as it comes up time and again and again, is one side of it. Uh, and then we draw into this whole thing uh, conflicts that the Greek people had with the Turks. Uh, we had a member today uh, from, from that perspective speaking. Uh, we bring all of these conflicts into this present place. I don't think it's helpful. I don't think it's constructive or productive for, for this place. Uh, I think it would be much better for Armenian and Turkish people to be getting together, uh, working through this. There was uh, many, many lives lost on, on both sides, and, and that is to be regretted. Um, I, in fact, uh, have talked with individuals from the Turkish community who would like to meet with people from the Armenian community, in fact, proposed this to an individual and said, can we kind of get on from here? Can we heal respectively uh, in, re in regard to the losses, the uh, terrible, tragic time back then? And this individual was declined. I hope that's not reflective or symbolic of, uh, of all Armenian people. I would hope it not to be true. Uh, but I know in this one case, there was that invite extended or offered, and it was just a flat refusal or no. I think we need to go back very quickly in history here to recognize that at that period of time, there was the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, and indeed, a, uh, for all uh, intents and purposes, an empire that was fairly benevolent. I think if you look and read in history, uh, one understands that they allowed a fair bit of local control uh, throughout that uh, vast uh, empire. Uh, they sheltered the, the Jewish people, they provided refuge to them. In fact, when the Jews were expelled in mass from Spain, 
Um, that's a kind of a cultural legacy, I think, that is uh, much to be uh, proud of, and it contradicts to some degree the Turkish claims that the Turks had in wa waged a war of uh, total ethnic cleansing here. Uh, of the multitude of ethnic groups which resided within the borders of the Ottoman Empire, has any other people made claims of genocide or as we have here today? In fact, many of our uh, Greek neighbors here in Canada have told us that Ottomans had sheltered them from the conflicts that raged amongst the European Christians, Orthodox and uh, Catholic at the time. But stepping back in history, Mr. Speaker, uh, at a time when Russia on the east there uh, Great Britain instigating uh, one of the main ethnic groups of the Ottoman Empire, the Armenians, to rise up against in the eastern part of the empire there. Uh, we did have individuals who, in fairly violent fashion, uh, Armenian terrorist gangs, let's be honest, and I, I'm al almost hesitant to, uh, to go out on a limb when I say these things, because I know that there could well be reprisals for people who speak, and there has been that within our own country. Uh, there have been assassinations within our own country back in the 80s and places around the world by Armenian terrorist gangs. And that doesn't uh, make me feel real comfortable even here speaking today on, on such a matter. Uh, these Armenian terrorists back at that time uh, intensified their actions. Uh, there were spor sporadic clashes between the Muslim and Armenian settlements there in Turkey. And then when the Russian army invaded eastern Anatolia in 1915, uh, those Armenian terrorist gangs, side by side with the Russian army, started launching systematic attempt, attacks against uh, the Ottoman troops, but also against their uh, civilian Muslim fellow countrymen. Uh, in addition to those attacks, the Armenian uh, gangs also assisted the Russians by cutting supply lines of the Ottoman army, which was fighting with an invading force. And under those circumstances, the Ottoman government decided to relocate the Armenians that were living in that war zone or war theater to, uh, to elsewhere, to other provinces in the empire. And the rationale for that decision was twofold, Mr. Speaker, to prevent the intercommunal massacres, to keep these two conflicting communities apart, and to cut the support extended by those Armenian towns uh, to the Russians. Uh, during the period in discussion, there were hostilities, there was famine, uh, there was ailments, there was banditry, and so on. Uh, heavily affected all of those communities there in eastern Anatolia. Innocent civilians lost their lives during that migration, which took place under some very difficult winter conditions, and those are the consequences of a war of unprecedented magnitude. But not, neither the distress of the Turks nor of the Armenians should be solely singled out. It was a tragic, a sad time in the course of history for sure. And these painful experiences were only part of the tragedy to which the whole of the Anatolian population was subjected. Um, I could go on at great length on some other things here, but I do want to allow some time to other members. And uh, I uh, am, I guess, rather concerned when I understand uh, genocide uh, kind of statements that we have around the world. It's generally that you're going after somebody to prosecute them in the uh, criminal courts, in the international tribunals, at The Hague or wherever. I'm not exactly sure who, if, even if this were to pass today, who you would be prosecuting, who you would be going after. Another thing that I guess concerns me a lot is when you have this passed in other countries, and there's uh, interesting in telling the countries that have passed this, not the U.S., not the U.K., not the United Nations, never having passed a motion, a resolution to this effect, uh, other countries that may have their own uh, vested motions for uh, doing so, but in France in particular, when as a result of passing a law somewhat to this effect, then you have a, uh, a lawsuit is brought against any, anybody who would question that. A professor, in fact, is now being sued because he differs with the Armenian perspective on, on this uh, tragic time in history. Uh, so I'm going to kind of leave it there, Mr. Speaker, but I do object to, and I think and hope all members across the House, uh, when they cast their ballot tomorrow, would recognize that we've often heard only one side of the story. And there were Armenians that were there trying to destabilize the, the empire at that time, were collaborating with the Orthodox uh, Russians on the east there. Uh, there was all those tragic, violent events occurring at this time. War is awful. War is ugly. And uh, I think it's a mistake, though, at this time in history, so many, many years later, to be dragging that conflict here 
and we should leave those things to the historians to uh, work out, uh, to come to some agreement in terms of what the actual facts were. But there is not that clear agreement, and I think genocide is far too strong a case to be using, and a, a term to be using in respect to what occurred. Tragic events that affect uh, the Armenian community and uh, likewise affect the Turkish community. So I rest my case, Mr. Speaker, and uh, would uh, incline to hear others at this point. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Oshlaga Maisonneuve. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. First of all, at the outset, I'd like to thank my colleague, the member for Laval West, or Laval Centre, rather. Laval, you do know how important Laval is in the economic development of Quebec. So I'd like to thank her for her initiative. And this is what pleases me about this motion and the tenor of the debate. I had uh, stayed for the first hour to listen to my parliamentary colleagues speak to this motion, and I think our colleagues uh, perfectly right to remind us of the importance of historic rehabilitation, because the motion we will be called upon to vote on tomorrow is not one that is accusatory in tone. It doesn't put anyone in a position of being accused of anything. I hope that on my next trip I go to Turkey and I'm addressing the Turkish community. I know that within the Turkish community there are people who, for whom peace is just as important as Quebecers or Canadians or Frenchmen or anyone else on this earth. However, it would be an error not to recognize that what happened in 1915 and preceding years, a time for which contemporary Turks should not be held responsible. We know they are desirous of having a positive dialogue with Armenians, but we are re rehabilitating historical memory. And it's on that behalf that uh, Brian Mulroney apologized to the Japanese-Canadian community. It's because of that historical rehabilitation that our colleague from Charlebourg launched together with a senator a book on a Holocaust commemoration. It's in the name of that historical commemoration that the member of the Archer Patriot tabled a motion on the deportation of the Acadians. That doesn't mean that we want to rewrite history. It is not revisionism. What it means is that we want to remember, take the time to recall that there has been suffering. There were historic conditions that led to what we call a genocide, and a genocide means something in international law. It doesn't mean the same thing as a tragedy. It's certainly not the same thing as a calamity as proposed by the Parliamentary Secretary. In this process of historical rehabilitation, we have to call things by their proper names. Now, I think that tomorrow all parliamentarians, because we all love peace, because we believe in a fruitful dialogue, because we feel that the Turkish community has great value, I think that tomorrow all parliamentarians will have to do what Argentina, Belgium, Cyprus, France, Greece, Italy, Lebanon, Russia, Sweden, Switzerland, Uruguay, the Vatican, and the European Parliament have done already. That is, ask us to remember that 1.5 million Armenian men and women died in a context of terrible historic tension as we knew was happening uh, early in the 20th century. We want to remember this so that such a thing never happens again and not even possible in the future. It's all the more important to do this, Mr. Speaker, and I think that the member for Mercier, who's a bloc critic for foreign affairs, did refer to this. It's all the more important to do this because the values of solidarity on the international level and international justice have been more present in our societies. Can one imagine that in 1945, when the UN was founded in San Francisco, 
In the Canadian delegation, as a matter of fact, there were two former prime ministers. Uh, they were people who were going to become prime minister. We had uh, Louis-Stéphane Saint Laurent and William Lyon Mackenzie King. The former prime minister and member for Calgary was too young to be in that delegation, but that does not take anything away from his great um, international credibility as a statesman. I wanted to say that in 1945, when the UN Charter was adopted, the U San Francisco statute did con refer to the idea of an international court of justice, an international criminal court. But what is that worth? And what is the point of having such institutions if, as parliamentarians, at a national level, we are unable to remember facts that must be recalled for what they are without complacency, without smugness, but in order to build something positive. I don't think that when the member for Laval Centre tabled this bill, or this motion rather, she was trying to stigmatize any community or make any accusations. She wanted she did not want people to be burdened by some historic accusation for which they are not responsible. We want the Turkish government to take its distance from uh, the events that took place when the Ottoman Empire existed and when modern Turkey, which was to be founded by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk in 1923, didn't even exist. So it's in the name of that ideal, that is of peace, that we believe it is possible to build a dialogue that we must remember the facts. Once again, Mr. Speaker, just yesterday I attended the launch of the book by the member for Charlebourg Jacques Cartier, who reminded us of the importance of remembering the Holocaust perpetrated in 1945 or the preceding years. When we remember the Holocaust, do we think that the Germans of today are belligerent? Of course not. When Byron Mulroney apologized to the Japanese Canadian community for the undue internship of some of their fellow citizens, Canadians are necessarily belligerent? Of course not. And as parliamentarians, we refuse to go beyond that. There are some people who tell us that if we recognize a genocide, as the one that took place in 1915, we will automatically stigmatize certain national groups. That is not our intention. That is not the intention of the member for Laval Centre. And I think that for all these reasons, tomorrow we must support the motion tabled by the member for Laval Centre. The Honorable Member. Uh, for Laval Centre now has uh, time to respond for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's not without emotion that I rise today to close the second hour of debate regarding recognition of the Armenian Genocide of 1915. My emotion is even greater because it allows me to share with you the respect I feel for the Armenian people and their remarkable tenacity in claiming recognition of this uh, genocide despite questionable sociopolitical imperatives. Their attachment to their identity and their history is an example for us all. On many occasions since 1993, the debate on the 1915 genocide was brought to the attention of the parliamentarians in this House, and yet only one debate was sanctioned by a vote. It was initi initiated by a bloc member, Mr. Michel Davio, April 23, 1996, in the framework of a Bloc Québécois Opposition Day, which was the official opposition at the time. The text of the motion was as follows, that the House recognize on the occasion of the 81st anniversary of the Armenian Genocide that took place on April 24, 1915, the week of April 20 to 27 every week, as the commemorative week for inhumanity to man's inhumanity to man. After many different uh, talks, 
the House simply talked about the Armenian tragedy rather than genocide. There was unanimous consent. For some, it was a step in the right dis direction. For others, it was better than nothing. Since the beginning of the 37th legislature, this is the fourth time that we have an opportunity to debate this important issue. And I'm very pleased that the vote on this motion will take place during the same week, and I'm talking about the text of the 1996 motion, it is the week commemorating man's inhumanity to man. This will be the first time that we have an opportunity to speak clearly through a vote recognizing history. By supporting motion M380, we will be adhering to what Etienne Gilson said about the meaning of history. It's not to get rid of it that we study history, but to save from the abyss the entire past which would disappear without it. It is to achieve that what without history would no longer be of the past. We want it to be reborn in this existence. It is high time for this parliament to join many other parliaments and not small ones necessarily that have recognized the Armenian genocide like the uh, Canadian Senate, which on 13th, uh, 13th of June 2002, following an initiative by Senator Shirley Maheu, adopted a motion recognizing the Armenian Genocide. As a matter of fact, I'm pleased to point out that on December 2003, the Quebec National Assembly unanimously adopted legislation proclaiming April 24th as uh, Armenian Genocide Memorial Day. How can we explain that a country like Canada that is so proud of its values of compassion and justice preferred to use a euphemism rather than calling a spade a spade. The Ger Armenian genocide was the first genocide of the 20th century. Unfortunately, it was not the only one. Many historians say that the 20th century was marked by genocide. This is a painful and worrisome reality. If we look at the situation right now in the Sudan, for instance, it seems that we have not drawn all necessary lessons from the past. While the world has become a global village, it is important to recognize that we all share responsibility. And as Mr. Robert Kacharian, the Prime Minister of Armenia, stated on March 24, 1998, a quote, genocide is not a tragedy only for the Armenian people, but for humanity in its entirety. In closing, allow me to say how much I hope that uh, this chamber will show the courage of its convictions. Next April 24th, the Armenian Genocide will be commemorating its 89th anniversary. I will be leaving political life. Nothing would please me more before I finish my mandate to than having contributed in my own way to giving the best gift possible to the Armenian people that is recognition of their history. Emil Erio said, the dead live as long as there are living people to think about them. We all have a duty to remember. Thank you for your support and the solidarity you will show to the Armenian people during the vote on motion M380. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. As it is 6.56 p.m., the period for debate is expired. The question is as follows. Ms. Dalfon of the deferred recorded division on motion number M380 under private members' business. Madame Delphine. Ms. Delphine Gerald, seconded by Mr. Asadurian, Ms. Mr. Kenny and Ms. McDonough moved that this House acknowledge the Armenian genocide of 1915 and condemn this act as a crime against humanity. All those in favor of the motion to my left will please rise. Madame Fifth row to my left. In favor. Monsieur Simard. Monsieur Simard. Monsieur Jobin. Monsieur Jobin. Mrs. Hinton. Mrs. Hinton. Mr. Epp. Mr. Epp. Mr. Lund Saanich Gulf Islands. Mr. Lund Saanich Gulf Islands. Mr. Mayfield. Mr. Mayfield. Monsieur Perron. 
M. Perron. M. Rochelot. M. Rochelot. M. Gagnon, Champlain. M. Gagnon, Champlain. Fourth row to my left. Tirabassi. Mr. Tirabassi. Mr. Cummins. Mr. Cummins. Mr. Chatters. Mr. Chatters. Mr. Schellenberger. Mr. Schellenberger. Back to Mr. Lunning and I'm Alberti. Mr. Lunning and I'm Alberti. Mr. Mark. Mr. Mark. Mr. Anders. Mr. Anders. Monsieur Gagnon, Lac Saint Jean, Saguenay. Monsieur Gagnon, Lac Saint Jean, Saguenay. Monsieur Godet. Monsieur Godet. Madame Girard Bougeau. Madame Girard Bougeau. Monsieur Roy. Monsieur Roy. Monsieur Cardin. Monsieur Cardin. Monsieur Desrochers. Monsieur Desrochers. Mr. Stoffer. Mr. Stoffer. Mr. Comartin. Mr. Comartin. Third row on my left. Ms. Neville. Ms. Neville. Mr. Stinson. Mr. Stinson. Mr. Doyle. Mr. Doyle. Monsieur Bigra. Monsieur Bigra. Back to Mr. Barnes Gander Grand Falls. Mr. Barnes Gander Grand Falls. Monsieur Asselin. Monsieur Asselin. Madame Gay. Madame Gay. Monsieur Ménard. Monsieur Ménard. Monsieur Plamondon. Monsieur Plamondon. Monsieur Bachan Saint Jean. Monsieur Bachan Saint Jean. Monsieur Marceau. Monsieur Marceau. Mrs. Desjardins. Mrs. Desjardins. Mr. Martin Winnipeg Center. Mr. Martin Winnipeg Center. Mr. Proctor. Second row on my left. Mr. Sorensen. Mr. Sorensen. Mr. Forsyth. Mr. Forsyth. Mrs. Ablancy. Mrs. Ablancy. Mr. Hearn. Mr. Hearn. Mr. Rajat. Mr. Rajat. Mr. Benoit. Mr. Benoit. Mr. Mills Red Deer. Mr. Mills Red Deer. Mr. Kenny Calgary Southeast. Mr. Kenny Calgary Southeast. Mr. Ritz. Mr. Ritz. Monsieur Sauvageau. Monsieur Sauvageau. Monsieur Guimont. Monsieur Guimont. Madame Saint Hilaire. Madame Saint Hilaire. Madame Picard Drummond. Madame Picard Drummond. Monsieur Godin. Monsieur Godin. Ms. Washerly Chalice. Ms. Washerly Chalice. Premier rangé. First row to my left. Monsieur Duplain. Monsieur Duplain. Mrs. Wayne. Mrs. Wayne. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Mrs. Skelton. Mrs. Skelton. Mr. Taves. Mr. Taves. Miss Gray. Miss Gray. Mr. Penson. Mr. Penson. Mr. Harper. Mr. Harper. Mr. Solberg. Mr. Solberg. Mr. Merrifield. Mr. Merrifield. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Duncan. Mr. Reed Lanark Carlton. Mr. Reed Lanark Carlton. Mr. Casson. Mr. Casson. Mr. Day. Mr. Day. Madame Gagnon, Quebec. Madame Gagnon, Quebec. Monsieur Paquette. Monsieur Paquette. Monsieur Duceppe. Monsieur Duceppe. Monsieur Gauthier. Monsieur Gauthier. Madame Tremblay. Madame Tremblay. Madame Lalande. Madame Lalande. Monsieur Loubier. Monsieur Loubier. Ms. McDonough. Ms. McDonough. Mr. Blakey. Mr. Blakey. Ms. Davies. Ms. Davies. In favor, fifth row on my right. Monsieur Patry. Monsieur Patry. Mr. Perich. Mr. Perich. Mr. Zabo. Mr. Zabo. Mrs. Zur. Mrs. Zur. Mr. O'Brien Labrador. Mr. O'Brien Labrador. Ms. Bolte. Ms. Bolte. Madame Folco. Madame Folco. Madame Jennings. Madame Jennings. Ms. Caratac Lindell. Ms. Caratac Lindell. Mr. La Liberté. Mr. La Liberty. Ms. Leung. Ms. Leung. Mrs. Longfield. Mrs. Longfield. Mrs. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Myers. Mr. Myers. Mr. Provenzano. Mr. Provenzano. Mrs. Redmond. Mrs. Redmond. Madame Thibault Saint Lambert. Madame Thibault Saint Lambert. Mr. Wilford. Mr. Wilford. Monsieur Prou. Monsieur Prou. Monsieur Binet. Monsieur Binet. Monsieur Castonguay. Monsieur Castonguay. Ranger à ma droite. Fourth row to my right. Monsieur Bertrand. Ms. Brown. Ms. Brown. Mr. Calder. Mr. Calder. Mr. Canis. Mr. Canis. Monsieur Harvey. Monsieur Harvey. Ms. Fry. Ms.